yok insanlara bir şey yok. One minute to start. All right, amen. It's the top of the hour, 11 a.m. And once again, it's time for Bethel Sunday Live. We are so uh, glad to have you with us this Sunday morning. So glad that you chose to spend this time of worship and praise with the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness. We've got a very special worship uh, experience prepared for you. We have a special guest. We're going to do uh, our Black History Moment uh, just before the message. And we have some acknowledgments to make. Of course, <clears throat> today would traditionally be the day that uh, Sister Angela Borden and I would celebrate our pastoral anniversary with the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness. It's been 20 years. Uh, we started the new millennium uh, as the pastoral family. And 20 years later, we're still here. Amen. And so we thank God for his keeping power and his grace and also for your love and your support. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today's celebration, uh, as it is, is as much a celebration of the durability and the persistence of believers as it is me being 20 years in pastoral ministry. That is a great milestone. At some point, I will take time to reflect on it. But right now, I'm most interested in this idea that we continue as a church, the Bethel Church, we continue to be a blessing in the kingdom. You know, the Bethel Church is what some 100 and is it five years old it'll be 106 years old this coming may mid-may um i'm the fourth pastor in its history that is a a remarkable testament to the consistency the persistency the faithfulness of generations 106 years that's generations of believers and still going with no hint of stopping in sight. And so we are thankful that the grace of God 
falls on us so freshly and so freely, and we celebrate his grace today. We celebrate uh, your, your bounty, your support, your love, uh, as it's been demonstrated in our lives throughout the year, Sister Angela and I, uh, with respect to our children and our home and ourselves and the concern you, you continue to, to express for us and your prayers for me in our most difficult times of life, you were there to help undergird us and we are so thankful for that. So we wanna say that we're thankful to the Lord today, all of us for another opportunity to give him glory, to give him praise. This is a day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I want to encourage you not to just be a spectator this morning, but to be a, a participant uh, in this celebration. Lift up your hands to the Lord. Sing out loud the songs of Zion. Give praise and glory to God wherever you are because he is worthy of the praise. As we are keen to say at our church, God is good all the time and all the time, God is good. And so we are thankful for him today. We're gonna start off. Uh, we've got quite a bit to sh share with you. So I don't wanna delay time. I uh, want to keep as much to our schedule as the Holy Spirit will allow. Um, we're going to start off with the praise uh, hymn or song that's going to be led by our own sister, uh, Precious uh, Michael. So let's say thank God for her as she comes at this time. Come on, are you ready to praise the Lord? Yes, we are. It's always time to praise the Lord because he's what? Thank you, Sister Michael, for leading us in that time of worship. Uh, we are going to have some acknowledgments at this time brought to you by our own First Lady, Sister Angela Borden. After that, we're going to have a, a time of prayer. Before we get into that acknowledge, the acknowledgments and the prayer, just want to remind you uh, to send all of your questions, concerns, prayer requests 
to our email address at BethelCOCH at gmail.com. For those of you who are video conferenced in either through Facebook, live stream, or YouTube, it's on the screen, but it's BethelCOCH at gmail.com. We're always glad to also have our teleconference attendees with us. So we also, for folks who want to join us by phone, they're joining us this morning also. If you want to mail us something, please send it to our PO box, not our physical address, PO box 11664, Los Angeles, California, 90011. Again, that's on the screen, PO box 11664, LA, California, 90011. Please do not send cash through the US Postal Service if at all possible. You can always call us at 323-232. 5463-323-232-5463. And if you are watching us on our YouTube channel, please know that we also have a Facebook page. You can find it by searching for the at sign at Bethel COCH. If you are on Facebook, know that we also have a YouTube channel. Again, you can find us using that same moniker at Bethel COCH, the at sign Bethel COCA, so you can find us either way. All right, God bless you. Thank you, Sister Board, for doing this for us. Uh, we're going to have acknowledgments at this time. Good morning, Saints. I'm so blessed to be here right now. I can't believe it's been 20 years. My baby boy was a toddler running through the church, and now he's taller than I am. And I'm just so blessed. You guys have blessed us every day with these 20 years, and we couldn't have done it without your prayers without your kind words, uh, without your thoughts. We're so grateful. I wanna read a couple cards that we received. Happy anniversary. Continue to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, five through six. Blessings, pastor and first lady. Congratulations on another year in God's service. Praising God for you both, Minister Sherry Gamble. Congratulations, Bishop Carnell and Lady Angela Borden. Thank you for your 20 years of service. Our expression of gratitude to you is for all the work you actually do and also in the very manner you manage this, our holy chore, Deacon Andre and Sister Diane Smith. All those yesterdays captured in sweet memories, love keeps them beautiful. All the warmth and gratitude that anniversaries bring, love makes them meaningful. Many others share your joy today as you celebrate your anniversary, as you reflect upon yesterday's memories, today's meanings, and what lies ahead tomorrow, you are wished love and happiness always. Deacon Andre and Diane Smith and Deaconess Ware. We, we also received letters and gifts from Bethlehem from Macedonia, Mount Olive, Washington Memorial, Christ Temple. We are so grateful for your thoughts, for thinking of us. We thank all the members and those friends who have sent love gifts, gift cards, but continue to pray for us. Prayer really helps us through. We all know that prayer changes things and God answers prayer. So continue to pray for our health, our strength, as we continue to serve you as God has placed us, for as long as God has placed us here. Be blessed. Amen, thank you. Thank you, Sister Borden, for reading those acknowledgments. And again, I join her in thanking you for your kindness, uh, your, your prayers, your well wishes, your continued support. We pray for you as you pray for us. Let us pray for one another. Amen? Praise the Lord. Um, we're going to have a time of prayer just now. Um, I haven't received any specific prayer requests this week. However, I've talked to quite a few. I know that some of you are um recovering from illnesses uh a couple i talked to uh not members of our church but associated with as part of our family uh actually have had COVID and are recovered or recovering from it so i thank god for those testimonies um i also thank god for you continuing to take care of yourself continuing to pra practice things like mask wearing in public and social distancing and doing what you can do uh, to keep yourself and others healthy and safe. So we pray that you continue to do that um, until such time as we can press through this particular season. 
in the world. Amen. Uh, so we're praying for those who are recovering from any illness. COVID isn't the only thing that folks are struggling with. I know that we have folks who have had strokes and heart attacks. We have been praying for Sister Felix, who was in a horrible uh, auto accident where she lost her husband. We're praying for her continued recovery. And there are so many challenges that people are facing. Some we know, some we don't know. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that God would heal you, not just for your sake, but for his name's sake, that he might get the glory because he is worthy. We're going to pray for those of you who are struggling financially. Um, because you are either unemployed or underemployed. You're not making enough to satisfy uh, all of your basic obligations. The Lord has promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. And so we are going to trust him to do that. If you're a believer, I need you to trust in him to do that, and we will stand with you. COVID has also caused some relationship problems. Some of us are spending more time with our loved ones than we have ever done and it's exposing weaknesses and relationships we're just getting on one another's nerves and we don't understand that and so we're thinking the problems are much more exaggerated than what they really are so i'm going to pray for you that that will give you wisdom grace and of course patience with one another now there are a number of other uh things that you are praying for we're going to stand in faith with you that god would hear our collective prayers and respond according to his will. So would you go to prayer with me just now? Father, I thank you for your loving kindness towards us today, for your tender mercies. Lord, it's your long suffering that has resulted in our salvation. And we are so glad that you've been so patient, so very, very patient with us. Father, as we await your coming, uh, we pray God that you would cause us to be lights in the world, that you would strengthen us, strengthen our hearts, Strengthen our minds, strengthen the human spirit, God, so that we might respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as the Spirit leads, Father, I pray that we are humble and sensitive enough to follow, that we would hear your voice, recognize your voice when you speak into our lives. God, we want to be instruments that are used by you, vessels that are filled with your presence, our hands to be your hands, our eyes to be your eyes and our hearts to be your heart. As we stand before you, we are painfully aware that there are times when we are not obedient, when we fail to do what we know to do, or when we do things we know not to do. Father, we acknowledge those times, each one of us individually in our lives where we have failed you. God, we express now with words our sorrow, but you see the repentance in our hearts, our desire to turn away from rebellion, to turn away from disobedience. God, I pray that you would forgive us of our sin, of our unrighteousness, and that you would cleanse us of its stain, even as we confess those things to you just now. God, we want our relationships to be in right standing because. When we come to you, we want to know by faith. We want to be assured by faith that you hear and will respond to our prayer. We have loved ones who need salvation, deliverance. We have those around us who are sick. God, you know every name. He who created the body we are trusting can also heal that body. That's you, God. And we trust you. We trust you. We trust you in our relationships when we are challenged by conflict and we don't quite know what to do or how to do to resolve it. God, give us wisdom, but also grace and patience to wait for you during the very difficult times of conflict, God. We want to be people of peace. We want to live peaceable with all men as it be possible, as your word prescribes we do. God, help us to do that. Help us to be what you have called us to be. Lord, you know every situation, you know every circumstance in our life, you know where we are stressed, you know where we are stretched. You know when our money is not enough. You know when our time is not enough, when our energy is not enough. But God, we trust you to be enough. Your grace is amazing. And we celebrate it today in the name of Jesus. And we stand up tall with our shoulders squared into the wind. And we know that all things are possible for us because we believe, God. We believe that. 
you are the great source of all good things in our lives. And so we bless your name now. You have heard our prayer and you are responding according to your will, not our will, but thine will be done is how we conclude this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you, God keep you. We look forward to receiving your prayer request in the future, but also once we have prayed for you, I do encourage you to contact us and let us know uh, the blessings that God has bestowed upon you, how he's answering prayer, so that just as we labored in prayer with you, we can celebrate and rejoice in victory with you. Amen? So we look forward to hearing from you uh, in the future. Praise the Lord. All right. I think uh, I have acknowledged everything. Um, again, thank you for your offering gifts. Um, using Venmo and Zelle, digital means of giving, of course, you are using the Bethel COCH name, Bethel COCH at gmail.com uh, will likely work, work for you. You can also send those gifts again to our PO box. Amen. All right, I think I've covered everything for announcements and prayer. Amen. So the final thing that I want to bring to you today is our Black History Month. So in the last couple of um, the last couple of Sundays in this Black History Month, we have focused on those whose names are not as well known. So the first Sunday we brought to you the brother of Sally Hemings. Of course, Sally Hemings is famed for having uh, brought four children from uh, her master, uh, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, her story is very well known. A, a lesser known story is that of her brother, James Hemings, who became Jefferson's chef and he even traveled on Jefferson's famous trip to France, where uh, James Hemings learned some uh, skills from French chefs who didn't have the same issues uh, dealing with blacks as James would face in America. And so he brought back to America those skills and some of those very special dishes. We talked about a couple of them, like the meringues from which we get the more famous lemon meringue pie. Uh, but he also brought back something that's a staple in what is referred to as black culture. And that's macaroni and cheese, macaroni and cheese. So next time you eat macaroni and cheese, think about Brother James uh, Hemings. The next week we brought to you Sister Angela. Sister Angela is one of, if not the first named slave in these United States of America before we were the United States of America. She landed on the shores of Jamestown. We talked about that and uh, immediately she was traded to the colonists there for supplies for the ship that, the pri uh, pirate ship that brought her in. And we talked about how she represents the fortitude uh, of Black people, the fact that she was able to come over here and sustain and survive. And there are relics of her footprint there in Virginia even today, and there are monuments to her. And her story is finally just now, finally, 400 years later, her story is finally being told. And I wanted us to take courage from that, both from James and Angela, that common people uh, your lives can be extraordinary. Your lives can be extraordinary. And I need us to know that too. Those lives were extraordinary and they're impacting us today. And then today I want to bring to you Robert Smalls. Robert Smalls, born in 1839, has a very interesting uh, story. Robert was a lamplighter. He was a dock worker. He was a rigger and a sail maker. He was also a hero of the Civil War. Robert was a husband and a father, and he was born a slave. He was rented out for labor to others. Robert eventually learned how to be a wheelman on a steamboat. It was in that capacity that the Confederate Army dragooned him or recruited him, it wasn't a willful act, um, and made him a wheelman on one of their steamships that they had converted to a gunboat. He and many other slaves manned that ship along with a few white uh, crewmates. One day, the crewmates went on to shore and they stood overnight, 3 a.m. in the morning. Brother Robert Small, seeing his opportunity, pulled together the other slaves and they stole the steamboat. 
now converted to a gunboat. They sailed it out to uh, a blockade of Union ships and promptly turned the boat over to the Union Army. He actually became a soldier in the Union Army, not just a soldier in one of the Black regiments, but they actually allow him to continue to pilot that same steamboat. In fact, there is a famous battle in which that steamboat came under Confederate fire and the captain of it wanted to surrender. Robert Smalls would hear none of it. He promptly took command of the boat and sailed them to safety, where he was celebrated for his bravery. He is cited as one of the pr uh, primary reasons why Lincoln was uh, so ready to allow Blacks to join the Union Army. This simple man, a lamplighter, a dock worker, a rigger, a sailmaker, made his mark on American history because he was opportunistic, because he was brave, because he was insightful. The grace of God has always fallen on common people to do uncommon things when they are willing to put their hands to the task. And I just encourage you in this season, when for many of us, it feels like we are hamstrung and we are constrained and we can't do anything. It is amazing what we can do. When we allow God to help us see the moment in history that we're in and to take full advantage of. We are able to do things that while in our lifetime may not seem very important or impactful, but they will go on to bless other generations. And many of you, like Robert Small, like Angela, like James Hemings, are doing things, have done things, will do things in your life that uplift others. And while you may not get the acclaim or the accolades or the trophies, please know this. When you submit yourself to be a servant to others, when you allow God to strengthen your hands so that you pour out his love to others, your life will be impactful, not just now, but for generations to come. After all, think about all the people who have come through your life, who have not now gone from labor to reward, who you still remember today. They're not in anyone's history books. There are no songs about them. No one's made a movie about them, but they were hugely impactful to your life, just as your life will be hugely impactful to someone else's. God bless you. God bless your faithfulness to him. And we are so grateful to have you in our lives. Amen. I'm going to have Sister Michael come back one last time for a song, at which point I will return and introduce our speaker for the hour. Let's say man for Sister Mike. Good morning, um, Pastor Gordon and Lady Angela. I want to dedicate this song to you this morning. Um, you know, all of our worship is to God, of course, but in honor of this um, wonderful day, I'm so thankful for your leadership, for your friendship, for your counsel and for your excellence in the way you administer ministry. I am grateful to be a proud member of the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness, and a great reason of that is because of you and how you serve us in excellence. Thank you. One of the things I know that you both do is you look to God as the source of your everything. So this song is just a worship song in acknowledgement of that. The title of the song is God, I Look to You. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me peace now. To see things like you do. God, I look to you. Your will, I said, comes for us. Give me wisdom. Oh, yeah. 
privileged to have with us today uh, our guest speaker. Uh, he and, uh, well, he came into our lives through Sister uh, Tara at the time, Tara uh, Gamble, the daughter of Minister Sherry Gamble. Um, 
they both attended Azusa Pacific University together at the time as undergrad students. And um, there's a whole story about the, the cat and mouse chase there. That's a beautiful story if you ever get a chance to hear it from them. But they married so many years ago, I was blessed to be the officiant at that uh, ceremony. And they went on to have, they've gone on to have, I believe seven children, six boys, five boys, two girls, five boys, two girls, amen. Just the blessed brood there. And um, he has been, uh, he's worked in various capacities at the Azusa Pacific University uh, and also um, for uh, a stint at Focus on the Family. Uh, he was also the Dean of the DeVoe Business School at the Indiana Wesleyan University. And he's currently the president of Trinity Academy in Wichita, Kansas. All that said, the most important thing for you to know about him is that he loves the Lord. I believe that part of his testimony. He is a very able minister of the gospel who travels to preach the gospel all over. Uh, he's a, a preacher's son. He's a pastor's son. Have I've met uh, his mother and his father on many occasions. I've preached for his father's church up north. He comes from a strong family. And I have no doubt that when you hear from him today, we together will be hearing from the Lord. I am so honored to have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Neeland Brown. I will give you over to him at this time that he might minister to you in God's way. Let's pray for him as he comes with the word from the Lord. Amen. I'm going to give you over to Dr. Brown. God bless you, Doc. Amen. Greetings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's wonderful uh, to be with you, Bethel Church family, once again. And it's an honor to share with you uh, on this wonderful Sunday morning. I want to rush to express my thanks to Bishop and First Lady Borden for extending the opportunity for me to share in such a wonderful occasion. And as well, I want to rush to express my uh, thanks to Elder Witt, who so ably facilitated our time together through invitation and just taking care of so many details, as well as Sister Joy Moran, who also pitched in and ensured that I had everything that I needed uh, so that I would not embarrass myself and not be up here ready to preach when it was time to preach. Um, I wanna also thank uh, Sister Precious Michael for leading us in singing worship. I'm always uh, so enamored and grateful for her gift. She is truly a gift to the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to also rush beyond my thanks to express uh, my celebration and uh, my uh, deep appreciation and my congratulations to Bishop and First Lady Borden, who have been so kind, diligent, and faithful in their ministry work. Um, years ago, uh, when I met Pastor Borden, he mentioned 20 years ago, uh, I suppose I would have just been um, getting my feet wet at Azusa Pacific University, a transplant to Southern California. At that time in my life, I would have just been grappling with my call to ministry, and I had recently uh, met my wife not too long before, but as he mentioned, she did not know at that point in time that she was my wife. But I believe that's just because I'm a little bit more holy than her. It takes a little longer to hear from the Holy Ghost, but that's all right. I do not judge or condemn. Uh, but it's been a number of years. Uh, we're grateful that Bishop Borden has been such a wonderful and First Lady Borden, such a wonderful part of our journey um, in both uniting and marriage, as well as my personal ministerial journey. Uh, grateful that he did, in fact, officiate our wedding and take us through counseling. And now, as he mentioned, we have seven children, uh, five boys and two girls. Praise the Lord for those bookended girls. But uh, since uh, he did conduct the wedding, uh, the Borden family is in part responsible for all seven of these little monsters who are on the move right now today. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you got to own a little bit of that. But anyhow, I, I want to say congratulations for 20 years um, in service at the Bethel Church. Um, I know that you have been an example of faithful ministry and Christian living, uh, both um, Bishop and First Lady to the Brown family, as well as I know to the Bethel Church family, and I know to the body of Christ as a whole, because we truly need 
faithful pastors and teachers in our midst. And I am grateful um, that I can count you as a, um, a part of my life. Well, let us turn our attention to the word of God and see what the Lord has to say to us this morning as a congregation um, on this special Sunday and this auspicious occasion as we celebrate um, 20 years in pastoral ministry uh, for the Bordens. Um, I'd like to raise a text from the book of Psalms. I've been preaching quite a bit out of the book of Psalms and studying and praying quite a bit in the book of Psalms <clears throat> over this past year, particularly in the midst of this pandemic. I'd like to raise Psalm uh, 11, the 11th Psalm, Psalm 11, and we'll look at it in its entirety. So that would be Psalm 11, all seven verses, Psalm 11, verses 1 through 7. Let us read this Psalm of David, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, and then we'll move forward with the Lord's Word for us today. Psalm 11, verses 1 through 7, read as thus in the English Standard Version of our Scripture. In the Lord I take refuge. How can I say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Verse seven reads, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. I'd like to tag the text this morning, seeing God in troubled times, seeing God in troubled times. Let us pray. Lord, let the seed of your word fall on the good ground of our ready hearts and bear much fruit. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Seeing God in troubled times. Opening in 1974, the Morris A. Mechanic Theater in Baltimore, Maryland, the musical was such a smash hit that it quickly moved to Broadway with a new cast one year later in 1975. And so great was its success under the bright lights of Broadway that this musical, which had begun in Baltimore, Maryland at the Morris A. Mechanic Theater in 1974, had its film rights purchased in 1978 by Motown Productions. And it was a box office smash on the silver screen. While many of the Broadway cast members were, mo were moved from the, from the Broadway production when it went to film to create space for bigger and larger entertainment names, such as Diana Ross, Michael Jackson, Nipsey Russell, Richard Pryor, Lena Horne, and Thelma Carpenter, to name a few, one of the original actors who was both in the production in 1974 at the Morris A. Mechanic Theater in Baltimore, Maryland, and moved with the production to Broadway in 1975, one of the cast members who made it into the silver screen was one Mabel King. Mabel King, this known and celebrated blues diva reprised her Broadway role as an evil witch aptly named Eveline. You may recall the show. It's that great Barry Gordy production that lives on in African-American folklore and cult classic status within film known as The Wiz. This soulful adaptation of The Wizard of Oz takes us with some of our brightest lights in the mid 70s in African-American entertainment. And it adds what I would say is a bit of Lowry seasoning salt to a standard American story. Mabel King, playing Eveline, sang a song that was popularized in the film. That song was entitled, 
Don't nobody bring me no bad news. Let me recite a few of the words for you. When you're talking to me, don't be crying the blues because don't nobody bring me no bad news. You can verbalize and vocalize, but just bring me the clues. But don't nobody bring me no bad news. Bring some message in your hand or something you can't lose, but don't you ever bring me no bad news. If you're gonna bring me something, bring me something I can use, but don't nobody bring me no bad news. Evil that wicked witch, sang that song as soon as we meet her, and all of her imps and servants scurried about her royal evil court as she sang, don't nobody bring me no bad news. Brothers and sisters, I believe that this song popularized by Mabel King in the Broadway Motown smash silver screen hit The Wiz has infiltrated the church today. We have in many ways constructed a Christian theology, which I would call a no bad news theology. And while this perspective of the Christian life positions for us a belief that our walk with Jesus will be a walk of uninterrupted health, wealth, all around prosperity and good times, I hate to bust your bubble, but I have to tell you there are moments where there are, where there is bad news. Yes, indeed, even as we walk with Jesus, we cannot be like Eveline and demand that we receive no bad news. There is bad news, and there are seasons of what feels like perpetual bad news. Let me get this right where we are today. In 20 years of pastoral anniversary, uh, of pastoral service, one of the things I believe that you learn and you realize is there is bad news in the work of ministry. It is what makes this calling of leadership so difficult for those who stand within it. Part of why we celebrate and we pause to recognize Bishop and First Lady Borden is because they have taken on the mantle of leadership. And while we like to believe the mantle of leadership is a, a seat in the pulpit, we like to believe it's recognition and the opportunity to preach in front of rapt audiences that follows. We like to believe it's anniversary days such as today. There are days of bad news, of difficulty and trouble that one has to walk through, that this couple has to make their way through in order to see their way to 20 years. Yes, there is bad news. What am I saying? What I'm saying is there is trouble in life. It is inescapable that we run into trouble. And when you carry the mantle of leadership, of pastoral leadership, of committed service to the local church and committed service to any denominational body, you will find the enemy attacks with much more gusto because you are in the lead chariot. And hear me say this, I believe this is what David is saying in Psalm chapter 11. This sweet psalmist of Israel is letting us know there have been troubled times that he has seen. A number of the Psalms that David has written come out of his trouble and his difficulty and be, can be directly connected to issues that he is facing within his life and within his leadership because he is sitting there in the lead chariot. But David does a great job in his songs capturing the fullness of what the Christian life is and giving us helpful and holy hints as to how we make our way through troubled times. What does it mean to be troubled? Psalm 46 and 1 declares, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. This word trouble in the Hebrew that is used at times in David's Psalms is actually a literal picture of being placed in a tight spot or being backed into a corner. Here is the bad news. The bad news is in this world, we will have trouble. That's what Jesus says. David says, God is our refuge and strength. He's a very present help and that's the good news, but here's the bad news. He's a help in trouble. There it is right there. When you're in a tight spot or you're back into a corner and life has tight spots, but this is what I like about the Bible. The Bible doesn't just tell you that there are tight spots. It gives you a prescription as to how you make your way through the trouble and through the tight spots. And here in Psalm chapter 11, we are not told exactly what the difficulty David is dealing with we can see from a simple read that his enemies are against him. And if you, as we look through these seven verses, as we walk through them, we notice three insights that we can lift up and carry out of the text today and be encouraged in our walk with God when we find ourselves in trouble or in tight spaces. Here are the three insights we gain from the psalm. Number one, we see that David... Uh, 
demonstrates a natural response to trouble. Then we see that David demonstrates in this song a spiritual perspective on trouble. And lastly, David gives us divine revelation in trouble. I said, number one, this little song gives us a natural response to trouble. Then it shows us a spiritual perspective on trouble. And then it gives us a divine revelation in trouble. Let's walk through them very quickly, and then we'll head on with our Sunday. In verses one through three, we see a natural response to trouble. Listen to me read verses one through three again. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? David begins the song by actually repeating in song in this poem. He repeats the words of his advisors or his counselors, those who are close to him, who are seeing an attack coming upon his kingdom and upon his leadership. We don't know again exactly what this attack is, but we know that David at one point had his own son Absalom turn against him and try and take the throne from him. We know Saul, that David has written Psalms while he he was hiding from Saul, that maniacal king who was trying to take his life, who went into fits of unconscionable rage and wanted to take David out just because God's anointing was on David's life. We see David in multiple episodes facing difficult situations in his life. And here is another difficult circumstance. And here is what he says. He repeats the words of his, of the words of his advisors. Flee like a bird to your mountain. For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot the dark, in the dark, the upright of heart. Here it is. The picture here is you gotta run, David. You gotta get away from this trouble. There are things coming at you that you cannot overcome. There are individuals who are doing this. Listen, it says the wicked bend the bow. What's that picture? That's literally the picture of how soldiers would fit their large bows when they wanted to shoot an arrow a long distance. You see, the bow was so great and the string was so taut when the bow was fully uh, upward, then they would have to lay the bow on the ground face down, put their foot in the midsection of the bow and pull the string upward towards themselves to get the string at a position where they could fit the arrow in it. It is literally, David's saying, my advisors are telling me, so prepared are my enemies to take the throne of Israel from me, that they have their bows on the ground, they are stretching their strings so that they can fit their arrows into the bow and take my life. That's the picture that we're given. Flee like a bird to your mountain. Behold the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright of heart. And here, look at the picture of the dark. It says not only are they going to bend their bow and fit their, fit their arrow into their string, but they're going to shoot you in the dark. They're telling him here, David, you don't even see what's coming. It's all working itself out under the cloak of darkness. The enemy's moving around you in the palace and in the kingdom trying to take you down. Who are bending their bows and getting their arrows set. They're going to shoot you when you can't see it coming, David. So here's what they tell him to do. They say, flee like a bird to your mountain. David, here's what you got to do. You got to run away. You got to run away and hide somewhere. You got to find yourself somewhere where you can be safe because there are individuals who are preparing their armaments to take you out and they plan to do it in the dark. And David says, how can you say this to my soul? And, and then he ends with a question. Here's the question, the question that they're giving. They're saying, David, they're individuals plan to kill you, plan to take you out. Their bow is on the ground. They're stretching the string into position. They're setting their arrow on the string and they're planning under the cloak of darkness to take you out. And then they say, you gotta flee to your mountain because here's the question, here's the question. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This image of foundations is often a statement in the Old Testament concerning the social order of society. For this reason, there is room to believe that whatever the threat, whatever it is that individuals are attempting to do to David, it is presenting itself against King David in such a way that it will put the kingdom at risk. There is a high chance that this issue is one of a coup that is going to take the throne from David that he is facing. We don't know exactly the situation that David wrote this psalm in, but here's what we know. The question that his counselors give him is, they say, look, David, they're getting ready to shoot you an arrow. They're planning in the darkness. And they're going to take you out when you least expect it. You can't see them. What do you do, David, when the foundations are destroyed? When the fabric of your kingdom is coming apart around you? 
what do the righteous do? Verses one through three give us what I just called a natural response to trouble. That's what they show. But then as we move on to verses four through six, David then in the song shifts from what his counselors say and gives us a spiritual perspective on trouble. Let me read verses four through six. Here it is. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Now listen to it. Verse three ends with a question from his counselors to David. David sings, here's what my counselors are saying to me. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the social order and fabric come apart, what can you do, David? If you lose your kingdom, what can you do, David? If your military turns against you, what can you do, David? If you are ran out of the palace, what can you do, David? If your enemies rise against you in the dark with their arrows and they are shooting you, what can you do, David? But from verse 3, where the question is asked, to verse 4, my assumption would be the questions now are going to be answered. David in this song doesn't even address the question. He just kind of leaves it suspending there in air at verse three and then moves on to verse four with what seems to be a different and unique thought. Here it is. David is given this question. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? But rather than answering the question, David shifts in verse four to a description of God, almost leaving the question just sitting there. Here it is. David, rather than trying to answer the question of what he will do if the foundations are destroyed, instead puts his attention on what God is doing. Here it is. He gives us a clear picture of what it is that God is doing in the middle of the trouble. That might be a lesson right there, Bethel family. Possibly the answer is when we find ourselves in trouble and the enemy is coming in like a flood against us, possibly the answer is not looking at the enemy, but looking at God. I like the way David handles that thing in verse four. Instead of talking about the trouble, David starts talking about God. And there are three things David says about God as he gives us this spiritual perspective on trouble in verses four through six. The first thing is this. He says, he says, listen, the Lord is in his holy temple. This is the beginning of verse four. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Now that might not mean nothing to you, but to somebody out there who show enough sanctification that means something to you. God, say, David says, I'm not going to look at what my enemies are doing as they bend their bows and set their arrows and plan my attack in the darkness and attempt to disrupt the foundations. And I don't know what I'm going to do as a righteous man. He looks up to heaven and says, but I see God is still sitting on his throne. He's in his holy temple and the Lord's throne is in heaven. This is our first lesson here that David gives us. As David takes a spiritual perspective and he focuses on what God is doing, we see God is sitting on his throne. Not only is God in his holy temple, but God is on his throne in heaven. David has a way in his Psalms of talking about God and his throne. You see, if he just said God was in his holy temple, God could be anywhere in the courts. God could be the cup bearer in the courts. God could be the armor bearer in the courts. God could be working the door at the courts. God could be guarding the, the, the throne in the courts. But he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. God is still on the throne. That's the first thing God, David tells us about where God is when we're in a moment of trouble. God is still on his throne. And that's good news right there. Even when we are in the most difficult circumstances, we can always take courage in knowing the Lord is in his holy temple and the Lord's throne is in heaven. God is still on the throne. That's where my grandma Lindsay would say it. She'd say all these things that are going on, baby, don't you worry about that. God is still on the throne. And that's good news that even when I find myself in difficulty, darkness, and trouble as I serve the Lord, I can always take heart in the fact that he is still on the throne. The first thing we see is that God is still sitting on his throne. But then look at the end of verse four in the beginning of verse five, it says his eyelids see, his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord test the righteous. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord test the righteous. Not only is God still on his throne, but verses 4b and 5a tell us this. David writes, God is watching the affairs of humans. He says God is still on his throne and God is watching. Here it is. David is clear that God is not just seated on his throne in the holy temple, but he's engaged in activity while he's on that throne. 
God is seeing humankind and God is testing the righteous. God is ever watchful of us, even in our troubles. His gaze is upon David, and today his gaze is upon us. This testing or examination is an image of testing metals as seen in Jeremiah 6, 27 through 30 and 9 and 7, that God tests us like he tests the purification of gold or silver, like he tests the strength of steel in a sword. So God is both watching, he sees humankind, but God is also testing the righteous. God is testing us. Us, even in the midst of our troubles, God is working in us to make us stronger. So a spiritual perspective tells us, number one, God is still on the throne. Number two, God is watching the affairs of humans. And let me give you number three. This is verses 5b and 6, a second half of verse 5 and verse 6. It says, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain down coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. God only sits on his throne. He's still on the throne, and that's good news. God sees us and watches us and keeps his eye on us, even as we're in our troubled times, even as our enemies are bending their bows and setting their arrows and is seeking to shoot us in the dark. God even watches us as the foundations seem to be destroyed and the righteous wonder what they are going to do. God sees us. He tests us through these moments. He makes us stronger through these moments. But God also rains down righteous judgment. God is not only seated on the throne, God not only watches the affairs of humans, but God is judging righteously. But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. God not only sits on the throne, sees us, but God also protects us. Here is a picture of God's just judgment placed on full display in this song. God hates the wicked and God rains coals and fire on the wicked. Sulfur and scorching wind will be their cup. God doesn't simply sit on the throne watching and not caring. God, David says, God will deliver me. Now the question of verse three was this. The question of verse three was, if the foundations are destroyed, David, what are the righteous going to do? If, you're, if the foundations, if the social fabric, if the kingdom comes apart, what's your plan, David? And David says, here's my plan. To remember that God is on the throne, to remember that God is watching everything that's going on with me, and to know that God will judge righteously. I like that right there, and I hope you can receive that Bethel Church of Christ, Church of Christ holding his family, and I hope you receive that on your 20th anniversary, Bishop and First Lady Borden. Even in the most troubled times, even as we battle pandemics and spiritual unrest, even as we deal with the enemy of our souls who is constantly on a campaign to attack us, even as we deal with health difficulties that we did not see coming into our lives, even as we deal with internal family struggles, with children or grandchildren or aunts or uncles or parents who are ailing, brothers and sisters, even as we deal with those who have come into life catastrophic situations such as car accidents or deaths that we did not understand were going to happen, even as we get bad doctor's reports, here it is, God is still on the throne. God is watching our affairs and God still holds judgment in his hand. That's what David says. So here's what the righteous are gonna do. The righteous are going to take a spiritual perspective on some bad news here on the earth. We're going to remember that God is still seated on his throne. We're going to remember that God is still watching the affairs of humans, and we're going to take heart in the fact that God is our righteous judge that sets all things straight that may be wrong. And if I hold on to him, he is going to make all things clear for me. Okay, 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 brother preacher, but here's the problem. The problem is David has given us a spiritual perspective on this situation. But I need some perspective that's a little more earthly. And this is why I like the way David lands this. And I'm going to say this last thing. And I'm going to leave you alone this morning. Matter of fact, dear sisters and brothers, before I get to this last point, I want to thank Bishop and First Lady Borden once more. I want to congratulate you on 20 years of pastoral ministry. I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be a part of this wonderful anniversary service. It's been wonderful and beautiful zooming in with you from what is now sunny. It was cold and rough, but it's sunny today. Wichita, Kansas. I'm grateful for 
for every one of you. I pray God bless you and be with you. I'm going to hit this third point. I'm going to hitch up my buggy and wagon and head on back home to the Ponderosa. Here it is. David, first of all, gives us in this psalm what we said was a natural response to trouble. David's friends say, since the wicked are against you and you got bad news and a whole bunch of trouble, you need to run. That's the natural response. Run and get out of it. David takes a spiritual perspective. He says, no, I don't got to run because God is still sitting on his throne. God is watching the affairs of humans and God will judge righteously. But then David gives us a divine revelation in trouble. And this is what I like. Verse seven, this is how David closed this thing up. We're going to go ahead and shout and get on home. So get ready in your living room because this is good news for you if you find yourself in any kind of trouble. Verse seven says, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. <laughs> I like that. That may not have shouted you, but that shouted me while I was studying that in my study. He says, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. That word upright can also be the word righteous. You could place the word righteous there three times in the scripture. You could say, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds and the righteous shall behold his face. Here in the ESV, it says, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds and the upright shall see his face. In verses four and five, we see that God sees the righteous. But in verse seven, the song concludes with the righteous seeing God. I like that. David says it's not enough just to tell you that God see, that you can that God sees you, but I want you to know God sees me, and that's the good news right there. And David says, but 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 here's here's the kicker. It says the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds and the upright or the righteous shall see his face. Now, God sees everybody. That's what we got as we were reading a bit earlier about God seeing the affairs of humans. It is suggested in verses 4b and 5a that God sees and tests the children of man and he tests the righteous. But it says God sees generally. God sees the righteous. God sees the unrighteous. But in verse 7, David doesn't say that everybody gets to see God. Everybody don't get to see God in their trouble. None but the righteous shall see God. That's the way they said it when we used to get baptized back home. They said, none but the righteous shall see God. And David tells them, oh my goodness, I'm getting happy virtually. I don't need to be doing all this. David says, God sees you. God sees everybody, but only the righteous get to see him. And that's David's promise that gets him through the trouble. The good news in this whole psalm is that David is reminding his counsel counselors who are telling him to run and hide from his troubles, that he doesn't need to fear, he doesn't need to run, and he doesn't need to hide because God sees him. And since he's righteous, he's going to see God. And that's my word of encouragement to you, pastor and first lady. And that's my word of encouragement to the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness family. And that's my word of encouragement to anybody who picks this up on YouTube and just watches it and you ain't even connected, but you need to hear this. Not only does God see you, but if you're righteous, you're you're going to see God. In Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14, David say, I would have fainted lest I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. David said, I would have given up, would have thrown in the towel, lest I believe that not only was God going to see me, but I was going to see God. And that's the good news right now. God will show you deliverance right when you need it. Can anybody testify with that? God will heal your body right when you need it. God will come through and make a way right when you need it. God will be a light in darkness right when you need it. And as they bend their bows and set their arrows in the darkness, God will provide a shield around you right when you need it. Because just as God sees you, you're going to see God. But nothing becomes dynamic until it becomes specific. So let me tell you a story. And then I'm going to go ahead and log off and leave you all alone. Our new baby girl, Kara, will cry in the middle of the night while she's in her crib. She'll cry in the darkness and cry, cry, cry. And when she wakes up in the middle of the night and she's surrounded by this shroud of darkness in the room, she'll just cry out, cry out, cry out. Now there are moments where Tara or myself may get up and look into the crib. At the moment we're looking into the crib and she's in the darkness, she believes she's in trouble. But what she doesn't know is she's being watched, so she's completely safe. Here it is. When she's crying and we're looking at her from the distance, but she can't see us, she is safe, but she's not yet comforted. However, when Tara or myself get close to the crib and scoop our hands up under her backside and her head and pick her up out of the crib, then she's 
sees our face and she'll stop crying because she's gone from being safe but not comforted to being both safe and comforted. This is what it is to be a child of God. When you're in trouble and when you're in the dark, David says, don't forget God still sees you. But every once in a while, you need to see God. And little Carol, calm down because she now knows she's in the hands of her God. Lord, this is my prayer right now for Bishop and First Lady Borders. Lord, let them see your face in the next 20 years in ways they haven't seen it before. Let them feel your presence in the next 20 years in ways they haven't felt it before. Let them see your hand at work in their lives, on their children, on their grandchildren, in their health, in their home on their finances in ways they haven't seen it before. There may be enemies who are bending the bow. There may be enemies who are planning their attack. But the good news is God still sees me. And I'm so glad I'm seen by God. And the good news is not only does God see me, but I'm going to see God. And I can declare that flat-footed with my back straight. I'm going to see his deliverance. I'm going to see his manifest blessing. I'm going to see his increase. I'm going to see his peace. I'm going to see his healing. I'm going to see his deliverance. Because the God who sees me, the upright, will see him. David tells those who are telling him he needs to give up. He needs to run away. He says, no, 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 no. I'm going to stay right here. Not only because God sees me, but because I'm going to see God. And in 20 years of ministry, Bishop and First Lady, I know you've seen God when you've been in bad news times, when you've been in troubled times, when you've been in the tight spaces. I know to be sustained for 20 years, you would have fainted lest you believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I pray over the next 20 years, you see him in new, incredible and wondrous ways because only the upright will see him. None but the righteous shall see God. And my prayer is you continue to see him in the land of the living. There may be someone listening to this message today. You may be in a troubled moment in a difficult space and time. I want you to take heart. If you are righteous, if you are upright, God's promise is not only does he see you, but you are going to see him. Keep holding on. Keep believing. God is still on his throne. He still sees you. He judges righteously. And you're going to see him. Don't faint. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. You will see God and see his deliverance. There may be one who needs to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to invite you to do so. Romans 10 and 9 reads simply, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. All you have to do is say, God, I confess, I speak that you are Lord. And I believe that you died, that you were buried, and you rose again victoriously for me and you're offering me new life. If you pray that prayer, God will save you now. As well, if you have a prayer request, I want to echo Bishop's earlier encouragement. Reach out to us. If you are in a troubled space, a dark place, if you are in difficulty, please send an email to BethelCOHC at gmail.com. Reach out to us with your prayer request. At Bethel, COHC can be used on the Facebook page where we are now or on the YouTube channel, the YouTube page, Bethel C-H-O-C. Reach out to us with your prayer request. I know the Bethel Church family would love to pray and minister to you. And also let us know if you've caught this video and you've prayed, prayed that prayer, you have confessed that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You said, Jesus, come into my heart, redeem me, save me. God will come to your heart right now. Friends, it's been a blessing to share in God's word with you today. Remember, even in your troubled times, God sees you. And for the upright, for the righteous, for his people, we're going to see God. God bless you. Amen. God bless you, man of God. So excited for that word. Amen. So excited for that word. Let me uh, just fix this real quick. 
Praise the Lord. We are so glad that uh, Dr. Brown could be with us today and that he blessed us with that rich word. That was uh, an amazingly encouraging message from God. God knows just what we need. Uh, he certainly knew what I needed and what Sister Borden needed. So thank you, Dr. Brown, for that wonderful word, for that call to discipleship. Again, if you would like to uh, have us pray with you and pray for you, our information is on the screen here, BethelCLCH at gmail.com, at BethelCLCH for YouTube or Facebook. Again, we are so grateful for the beautiful Brown family and the blessing that they've been in our lives. We are uh, so excited to see this great man and woman of God, Neil and Tara, just doing wonderful things in the kingdom and how God is promoting them season after season. We find that the entire Gamble family is a blessing to us. Minister Gamble, uh, Sheree Gamble, Tara, her daughter, and, and Cindy, and certainly Joy, who is serving at the Bethel Church of Christ Holiness currently. God bless all of you for, for joining us. Uh, there's so many things I could say. I don't want to belabor the time. I just want to say thank you to our church staff. I want to uh, send out a special thank you to our uh, assistant pastor, Pastor Willie Witt, uh, who just does so much, both seen and unseen. So grateful for our deaconess, uh, Sylvia Ware Rucker. We're so grateful for our deacon, Andre Smith. Grateful for Joy Moran and for her husband, Cesar Moran. Um, am I forgetting anyone from the staff here? Please do not let me forget anyone. I think that was it. Amen. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you to our musician, Precious Michael. Uh, and for all that you all do and all that you give uh, without asking for special attention, we do appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate the entire Bethel family. We appreciate our extended a ACLCH family, the Bethlehem Church in Pasadena, Mount Olive, Macedonia. Thank you all for your prayers and your support. We're going to let you go now. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Brother Brown. We're going to end with the word of prayer today. Am I missing anything? Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Amen. Have a great week. Lord willing, we will see you either in Elder Witt's Tuesday uh, noonday Bible study or in our Wednesday evening scripture study. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness towards us. We thank you for that wonderful word. God, we know, we know that you see us and one day we shall see your face and we are so encouraged. We are so encouraged just by your presence in our life now. Your presence is discerned, discerned in so many ways. We feel it, we see it, we experience it. We know by faith you are with us. You promise to always be with us and we are grateful. As we leave this high time of worship and of praise, God, we move forward with your spirit leading and guiding us as your children. And we are thankful for the doors that you are opening and even doors that you have closed. God. Make us to ever be lights in this world for you, to draw someone else to you. That's our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. God bless you. God keep all of you. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.